Good morning, everybody. Lily so and not Dr. May. So uh, she's feeling pretty quickly this morning, unfortunately, she has pneumonia. So she's under the weather. And so I am going to sub in for her this morning. Um, my name is Mike Slattery. I'm the chair of the department and I'm going to teach sections of this course. And uh, Rhea and I are exactly in the same spot in the semester, which has worked out quite well this morning. So what I'm going to do uh, is pick up right where she left off. I think she said to me that you stopped at palm oil, but I'm going to take a step back just for a few moments uh, and cover this slide again, just to uh, get everybody back up to speed. Let's see if I can get some mood lighting here for a minute. Uh, Fourteen lecture all three for a while. Yeah, is that okay? okay? You guys can see everything. Okay. Great. Um, and so we'll talk about. Uh, we'll finish off the material on deforestation, then we'll see how we go in terms of time. Bless you. Uh, and we may start on the biodiversity. Uh, apparently, you get two British accents in the same course. So there you go, even though I'm not from England. Um, okay. So uh, what I'm also going to do is uh, I'm going to, I have got the, uh, the lecture recorded on Zoom as well. Uh, so we will be able to follow that and see what has been covered, and then I'm sure she will open up for questions. So you won't be at any disadvantage, uh, for sure, when it comes to the final exam. Okay, and please, as I go through this this morning, uh, interrupt me, throw your hands up, ask questions. I'm not going to just try and rush through this for the sake of getting through it. Okay, so please do that. I know each faculty has their own. Uh, way of teaching. Uh, I've sat in on Reese's class a few times. She has those really cool A, B, C, D things. I haven't done those, so you're you're free from the, the flip cards this morning. But please, if there's something that doesn't make sense or uh, I'm contradicting what she's saying, then just ask away. Okay. So, so the topic here is deforestation, right? And this is one of those environmental issues um, that unlike climate change, I know you've just gone through a whole section uh, for several lectures on climate change, deforestation really isn't that controversial per se. Part of the reason is we can really measure it and observe it and quantify it, right? Certainly since the 1970s, when we've had spaceborne platforms like satellites and high resolution satellites, as those satellites have become more granular over time, we've gotten a better sense as to how much forest is being removed. Um, what's a little more controversial, or I should say complicated, is the underlying reasons, right? What's driving deforestation worldwide? So the way in which we've structured uh, these lectures is we talk about the direct drivers, okay? And I know that Re has covered uh, the big direct driver, which is this catastrophic conversion of untouched forest to uh, agriculture, right? To cropland and to pasture, right? So that is by far and away the overriding driver of deforestation globally. We are pushing further and further into these biological frontiers as we put more land under production to feed more and more people. And of course, as you know, we're going to get another couple of billion coming along. Come on in. Okay, so um, under that broad umbrella of these direct drivers, the conversion of cropland, a uh, conversion of forest into cropland and to pasture, uh, we then talked, uh, Dr. Mayne talked a little bit about these three major commodities, right? You touched on the first two. So the first two major commodities are commercial scale soya bean plantation, right? And we focus a lot there on the Brazilian Amazon for many reasons, uh, because it is such a biodiverse region and it's so large, right? But the deforestation of the tropical Amazon uh, has been driven to a large extent, at least during the 90s and 2000s, I suppose, by um, soybean plantations. Okay, so that's the one major commodity. And the second major commodity that she talked about was, you remember? Cattle, cattle launching, yeah. Okay, the conversion of forest into pasture or cattle launching, right? Something like two thirds of all the global deforestation can be linked to the cattle ranching. So this diagram where I want to start this morning, uh, which she touched on, shows uh, the Amazon. Uh, 
uh, which spans several countries, right? But the big one here is Brazil. And anything in red here is commodity-driven deforestation. So this is a combination of cattle ranching uh, and soya bean plantations with a few other very small scale things. But anything in red is essentially cattle and soya bean plantation. And she touched on, I think, Paraguay, parts of Northern Argentina, right? Where cattle ranching is so widespread there. Okay. And the light yellow here, which is what I'm gonna to get to in just a little bit uh, in another part of the world, is the shifting agriculture, right? So subsistence agriculturalists that don't own the land, own the land, that then go into the forest and cut down two to five hectares at a time, burn it, the slash and burn agriculture, right? So, so the two big commodities in South America and in the Amazon and the Brazilian Amazon are really soybeans uh, and cattle ranch. Okay, this is the third one, right? The third big uh, commodity is palm oil. And palm oil, which is a monoculture, I don't know if any of you have been to any part of the world that has palm oil. Do you want to to Costa Rica here? Yeah, okay, so one of my favorite countries in the world, some of the coastal cities there, you drive down to places like Manuel Antonio and you see row upon row upon row of palm oil. Uh, this, the oil that you get from these, from these palms is in so many things. If you just go to Target or Palm Sun or wherever you shop and you start looking at just how much palm oil is in our products, everything from ketchup to makeup and probably everything in between, right? So it's not just about producing oil uh, to put into bottles to cook, okay? This is a product that is, that is widespread. And one of the parts of the world that has been devastated by palm oil production is the island of Borneo, right? This is the third largest island in the world. So it's in uh, South, Southeast Asia. It's made up of three countries. So Malaysia in the top right, Indonesia in the bottom, and then a tiny little kingdom here called Brunei. Uh, and I use this diagram to show over a period, as you can see there, from 73 to 2018. So almost, you know, 45 to 50 years, the extent of deforestation on Borneo. Uh, I had the, I guess, privilege, I suppose, to spend a week on Borneo looking at deforestation and palm oil here. It's just absolutely extraordinary, the change uh, in the landscape uh, that you see. So this is what it looks like. Here is a, uh, a monoculture of palm oil production. In terms of um, protecting the soil, it's certainly better than just removing uh, virgin forest and putting it into pasture, right? But the biodiversity, which is the next link uh, in this series of chapters here in the story, the biodiversity goes down dramatically, right? So here is untouched primary tropical forest juxtaposed next to a palm oil plantation. On the right hand, on the left hand side here, I should say, is a map of Borneo, and all these little black outlines are palm oil concessions. They're also pulpwood concessions for, for timber but it's, it's extensive. Now, there's some good news here. And, and I think one of the things I try and stress, and I think he's probably done the same here in this class, I hope, is that this is not all doom and gloom, bad news, right? There's a lot of environmental success stories. You guys did stratospheric ozone, right, as an example, or air quality in the United States that is getting better and better all the time. So Borneo has actually begun to really turn the corner here in terms of just how much deforestation we're seeing uh, in terms of palm oil. But it's the things that live inside those forests that are also being impacted. There's this critical link, right, between deforestation and species diversity or biodiversity. So these majestic creatures, uh, the orangutans, which you have probably seen maybe in a zoo, um, the estimates on Borneo is that we've lost about 100,000 of these uh, orangutans in the last three or so decades, almost exclusively due to palm oil production. Right. So the governments of Malaysia and Brunei and Indonesia have gotten together and said, we've got to, we've got to somehow turn this around. Does that make sense? So those are the three big commodities, right? Pasture, um, palm oil, and, and soybeans. Uh, there's, there's a lot of unintended consequences, I guess, or knock-on effects here in terms of palm oil production. Uh, I've edited one or two of these slides just slightly, so if you're looking at a slightly different version, um, but I think this is an important one, right? And that is that when they go in to remove uh, forests or any vegetation to put that land into palm oil, a lot of that land is under these peat lands, right? Peat, which is uh, slowly decomposing organic material. And these 
peat, peat lands or swamp lands, just think coastal swamp lands of Louisiana, for example, right? Those peat lands hold enormous amounts of carbon. They are carbon sinks. And so when you go in and put palm oil and you burn them uh, and you release all that carbon into, into the atmosphere, that packs a pretty significant, I think, climate punch when it comes to uh, deforestation in palm oil. So it's not, and a lot of these concepts in this class, right, are not just standalone isolated concepts. They are really all interlinked and interrelated. So I think that's, that's an important point. So, so the commercial scale transformation of the landscape has absolutely driven deforestation. But, but subsistence farming, slash and burn farming is, is also one. Now, did Dr. May talk about slash and burn specifically yet? Or not? Okay, she has, okay. So subsistence farming um, is enormously problematic in, uh, in tropical regions. And part of the reason for this, there's this really odd paradox in the tropics, right? For those of you who have walked through a tropical rainforest, been to Costa Rica or any of, any of these other countries, they're enormously rich, they're diverse, the vegetation is thick, right? These tropical forests are immensely dense in terms of their biodiversity, and yet the soils on which the forests reside are relatively poor in nutrients. It's a really odd paradox. I think a lot of people, I know when I take my students to Costa Rica, we walk through the rainforest and and I think the, the sort of thought is that, well, these must be enormously rich, nutrient-rich soils, but in fact, they're not. And part of the reason for that is that things happen so quickly in the tropical rainforest, right? It's warm, it's moist, and all that geochemical cycling that goes on, the nutrient cycling that goes on, uh, all happens very close to the surface, very quickly, right? So things decompose very quickly in a tropical rainforest, and those nutrients get taken up into the vegetation very quickly. The point is that very little of those nutrients get into the soil. And, and the knock-on effect of that is that when you have subsistence farming, right, so people going out and cutting down two, three, four, five, six acres, whatever it is, the slash and burn technique where they go in and they cut the vegetation, they burn it to try and get those nutrients into the soil, that produces a crop in a year or two, and then those nutrients are gone. Right? And this is part of the problem with shifting agriculture or subsistence farming, is it's sort of, what have you done for me lately? The, the, the short-term cash impact of clearing the forest, burning it, getting the nutrients in, planting a cash crop, whatever that cash crop is, and then in two or three years, you run out of nutrients and you're done. And so you've got to move on to, to the next plot of land. So that's a real significant issue. And then finally, in terms of commodities, uh, we can't forget this, right? I think there's still this notion that deforestation worldwide is being driven by uh, wood products, so taking out valuable hardwood trees to make furniture and so on, right? Or paper products. Um, and so these are not insignificant, right? But it's nowhere near the impact of cattle farming, soybean production, palm oil production, and so on. So the estimates vary depending on where you are, but I think 10% is about a pretty good estimate of global forest loss is as a result of uh, wood products, okay? So again, not insignificant, but if we're gonna tackle deforestation in a meaningful way, and I think many organizations are trying to do that, and governments, it comes down to the commercial scale agriculture being key. Um, in terms of wood products and logging, there's this term selective logging, okay? So this is um, an approach where uh, a timber company would go into a forest and selectively take out the most valuable hardwoods and leave the rest, right? So this is not what we call the clear cutting, where you go in and do exactly what the term is, bulldoze the entire forest out, and then take what you need and leave the rest, right? Selective logging, is a more sensitive, environmentally sensitive way of, of taking trees out of a forest, but it is far from perfect, right? Because you've got to get the machinery in there anyway, you've got to cut a road to get into the forest and then take those trees out, right? Um, in some parts of the world, they've gone in and done selective logging through helicopters. So you go in, cut the tree down and take the tree out by a helicopter, but that's just so expensive. The return on your investment goes down dramatically. Right? So it's much easier just to go in with a bulldozer and go flatten the whole thing and then take out the trees 
preset you need. And selective logging is practiced. Um, so when we look at um, these large scale uh, commercial farming practices, so if we just go back to the commodities of pasture and um, uh, and cattle ranching and, and oil palm plantations, uh, that's very different if you go to other parts of the world, right? So the reason I show this diagram here is this shows the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in the DRC, this very large country in Central Africa, as part of these great African forests. Um, on the left here in pink is tree loss, right? So where you see pink, that is where trees are being removed. So that's tree cover loss in a decade, right? On the right is what's driving tree loss. And this is, as you can see in yellow here, but it's small shifting agriculture. So this is subsistence farming doing the deforesting in a place like DRC. You don't see soybean production. You don't see on palm oil production. There's no cattle ranching here. There's a few little red spots, which are very small scale um, cattle ranching. The rest is all subsistence farming, right? So you compare the DRC to Brazil, for example, and it's a completely different picture. These are people who don't own the land, they're impoverished, and they are going around moving trees to plant crops or to cut down trees to produce charcoal, uh, and it's devastating blessing, right? So it's an important point here when we talk about an environmental issue like deforestation, that you're not comparing apples with apples if you look at different countries, right? Brazil and the DRC are very, very different. Does that make sense? Okay, so the, the pink is tree loss, the yellow is what's driving it. Okay, so to begin to sort of wrap up deforestation, when you look at the direct drivers, right, the things that are doing the deforesting, okay, the cattle ranchers, the soya bean kings, uh, the oil palm plantations, the second thing that we have to start looking at is, okay, why is this happening? What are the indirect drivers of deforestation? What are the reasons behind that? Okay, I've traveled to a lot of different tropical countries, and when you talk to people that, especially, and I go back to one of my favorite countries all the time, Costa Rica, they know. Like cutting down trees is bad for the environment, right? So why does it go on? Well, it goes on because of money, right? Cash. Many of these countries are under foreign debt, okay? They're getting strangled by foreign debt. They're cash-strapped countries. They're generally developing or poorer countries. And when you look at a virgin forest, that's not generating any revenue for a landowner. What's more enticing to leave that forest or to cut it down and plant something that they can sell? So there's a there's a lot of challenges here to, to deforestation, okay? So that's the first point here. There's a need for money in these poorer tropical countries, right? There's also a very large Western appetite that is feeding this and no pun intended, right? So what I mean by that is if you're cutting down trees and you're planting feed and growing cattle, then that beef consumption goes somewhere. Now, please, I'm not going to lecture you on becoming a vegetarian because I am not one. Right? I like a nice eight ounce feeling more than most people. Okay? But, the, but the challenge is doing it in a responsible way. Um, and as the world continues to grow and we get another 2 billion people and we become richer and richer, my point is we're going to see these Western consumption habits increase. And that's just going to put more and more pressure on these forest systems, right? More pressure on these countries to cut down their trees, right? Um, and this last part here, subsistence farmers raise crop driven by the basic need for food. Again, this comes down to, um, in a sense, a life and death choice, right? These are people that don't own the land and they need to put food on the table. And the way in which they do that is to cut down the resource like the tropical forest to grow crops. And so that's, a, that's a, an enormous challenge. Um, there's a nice quote here in the slides on this notion of multinational corporations and big corporations outside people coming in to indigenous lands, right? The territories of indigenous peoples who have been given land rights have been significantly better conserved and protected against deforestation than the adjacent land, right? So this is, there's a lot of work now being done on uh, indigenous peoples and, and the, the preservation of those lands, right? Many people, many uh, tribes and communities have a long history of environmental stewardship. So what do we need to do? What needs to be done here in terms of 
uh, deforestation. So there's a couple of things, right? This is, I think, one of the most pressing things that needs to be done. And there's a lot of extraordinarily good work going on here. And that is to preserve as much as we can, as quickly as we can, right? Either through government programs or through nonprofits, through wealthy individuals. In other words, let's just stop what we're doing and try and preserve as much as we can. And the notion of dead communities, bless you, I think Dr. Main talked about that in terms of the herringbone pattern of deforestation, right? Fragmenting a forest, which is what you see on the bottom right of this satellite image. This satellite image is what we call a false color image. So anything in red is, is rich vegetation. And so you see big clear areas here and the herringbone pattern here. We have to try and preserve these communities intact as much as we can, right? And I've seen that. Uh, across the world with communities. Some of them are rich individuals like you, uh, Bono and Sting, two of my favorite singers, right? They spent huge amounts of personal money and raised money for indigenous communities in the Brazilian Amazon to try and buy up land and preserve it, right? Organizations like the Nature Conservancy uh, do the same thing, go into countries and say, we will buy that land as long as you put it into a pre preserved area, a reservation, where there can be no development. So that's the one thing that needs to be done, and we're seeing that. At the same time, you have to look at the economic needs of the countries in which these tropical forests reside, right? And I talk about this, I think, in different ways, uh, especially when it comes to conservation. It's one thing to look at a country or a region through a Western lens, through a US lens. I, I experienced this in my home country of South Africa when we talk about wildlife conservation in South Africa, right? A lot of people look at that and they, they have all the best intentions in the world coming from Europe or Canada or the United States and they want to help. And how do we how do we do wildlife conservation in Southern Africa? But you've got to look at that through an African lens, right? What does that mean in terms of the money on the ground and how that money is being spent? So we have to address the economic needs of these nations, right? You can have broad scale projects going on but you have to use local scientists with a local cultural context uh, to understand what's going on on the ground. And again, this, this burgeoning international debt that a lot of these countries have are enormously problematic. So if that makes sense, I think it's a two-pronged approach to looking at deforestation. Um, I will make one comment here before we open it up to questions, and that is you see, again, a lot of good news in the world right now. And I go back to like, Costa Rica, and I always sort of belabor this country because I love it so much and I've been there so much. But in the late 1990s, uh, about two thirds, maybe as much as three quarters of Costa Rica had been deforested, okay? And a large part of that was actually incentivized by the government in the 1970s and the 1980s right, to raise cash. And the big driver there was cattle, right? Beef, so cut down the forests, grow beef, sell it on the international market, make lots of money. By 1995-ish, somewhere in there, uh, about 20 to 22% of Costa Rica was covered with, with their tropical forests, right? Now, they're above 55%. They have completely turned that narrative around. Okay? And part of that has been driven by the government itself again. So in Costa Rica, the government has this really interesting scheme uh, I'm not sure you'll see the see how this off. They've got an interesting scheme here called PES. Uh, PES stands for Payment for Ecosystem Services. What does that? What they do is the government raise taxes through a gasoline tax, and then they pay people not to cut down trees. Right. So I've got a good friend of mine who owns about 100 hectares, and he gets $65 every year for every hectare from the government. That he doesn't touch, right? Does that make sense? The governments are paying for the ecosystem services that the forest provides, that habitat and the climate regulation, protection of the soil, all of that. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? 100 hectares, $65 a hectare, that's six and a half thousand dollars a year. Okay, he gets that for not cutting down his forest, but that's about 40% of what the median income is in Costa Rica for the year. So there's huge incentive for landowners to not cut down their forests. And that seems to have worked really well. So we've gone in two to almost three decades from 20% forest cover back to 50 something plus percent forest cover. And now for those of you who have been to Costa Rica, 
It's become a major ecotourism spot. People want to go there to see the tropical rainforest, right? And do cool things like zip line and sit in hot tubs and you know, drink Singapore slings or whatever the case may be. But it's to visit a place like this to enjoy the landscape and, and the beauty of the nature. All right. Need a sip of caffeine here. Questions, thoughts, comments? Anything conflicting or confusing? All good. Quiet 8 a.m.ers. I know. Okay. All right. So let's go on to this. How are we doing on time? We are doing well. My phone did it absolutely explode. Okay. So biodiversity, right? So you've done a lab, and I think you spent some time in lab throwing some beans around on the floor, right? Looking at islands and things like that. Okay, so you're familiar with biological diversity. So a couple of things that we're going to reiterate here. Um, but the overriding question for me when it comes to biodiversity is, I think what Dr. Main has put underneath here, so what? Why is it important? Why should we be concerned with the loss of biodiversity through human impact. Okay. And one of the themes I think that is important in this class is that we're always dealing with two things as we move through these topics. One is natural cycles, and the other is human impact on those cycles, right? So climate changes naturally. What are we doing to climate to accelerate that? And that theme comes through very strongly when it comes to biodiversity. Species change over time. They evolve, they die, they become extinct. Extinction is a natural process. What are we doing as a species to potentially accelerate that? Okay. But the overriding question here is why should we care? Why is it important that we haven't seen the golden toad in Costa Rica since 1987? Right? That species, that little frog, has gone extinct, we think. Right? We haven't seen it in 40 plus years. So what? You know, I mean, that sucks for the golden toad, right? But it's not fundamentally changing the way in which we live our lives. Is it? Probably not. Why do we spend so much time and money on big glamorous species? You know, my passion is the Rhino Conservation Project here at TCU, and everybody's got their, their big glamorous species. We love pandas, we love elephants, okay? But it's the little things that really run around the world. And if we let those go, we are going to be in trouble. So there is a there is an important, a really important applied aspect to this. What do species do for us? But there's also a very deep-rooted ethical aspect to this, right? What does it say about us as a species if we just let them go? So why is biodiversity worthy of protection? Why is this natural capital that we have on this planet so important? Okay, that's the that's the driving question of all of this. Okay. Um, and how can we lessen the conflict, right? And what happened to the white slide here? But how do we lessen the conflict here between the economy and ecology? And that's a really important point, right? Because there's two things I think that human beings do really well. One is we reproduce, and two is we improve our condition, right? We always want to try and improve our condition, move along this development path from impoverishment to fully developed, right? So that, right, the economy and growth and consumption and all the things that we kind of do as a species comes into conflict with the biosphere and the ecological world, right? So that's an important, that's an important question. An interesting little diagram here on this sort of triangle on the three apices are the economy, right? So that's consumption and wealth production, ecology. Do we have special duties and responsibilities to other species, right? And if so, if we have a duty to protect the rhino or the orangutan or the golden toad, right? If we have a special responsibility to the bog, the bottom right hand. How do we balance those responsibilities with our responsibilities to human beings and the economic well-being of human beings? And the third, the top one here is absolutely critical, right? What does that mean for everybody else? Equity, right? There's a very important uh, concept and component of environmental science, which is environmental justice, 
right? There's a reason why people are disproportionately affected by air quality or whatever the environmental issue might be. So those three things for me always go hand in hand. How do we balance the economy with environmental equity and justice and the preservation of biodiversity? And this term sustainable development, right? Uh, is kind of the, the center pivot of that, right? How do we continue to develop, but do that sustainably? If that makes sense. So I like that diagram, it's a good one. Okay, so here's the big challenge, right? 200 years ago, 300 years ago, whenever it was, we used to build fences to keep animals out. Okay? When we had less than a billion people on the planet and large areas of our ecosystems were untouched by human beings, now we build fences to keep them in. Right? When I take students to South Africa on our biodiversity trip, we go down to a game reserve. It's absolutely awesome. We spend 10 days there and we're doing procedures on animals. These are very small, relatively speaking, enclosed systems, right? 20,000 acres, 50,000 acres, whatever the case may be, where we're trying to keep and preserve these species in these supposedly natural ecosystems with there's fences around them. Right, with cities and roads and agriculture and all those kind of things. Okay, so the term biodiversity here really refers to the variety of life, the number of species, the distribution of those species, the richness of those species. And I must stress, not just the glamorous species, not just the megafauna, the lions and the tigers, and so on. Right. Now, here's a, here's a challenging question: How many species are there on the planet? We don't know. So that's a challenge, right? How, if we're gonna try and preserve species, how do we know which species to preserve if we just don't know how many there are on the planet? We actually have a much better idea of how many things there are in our solar system, which is much more up Dr. Main Street than mine, right? But you would think we would have a really good handle on how many species there are on this planet, but, but we don't, okay? And it's, it's, it's very, very challenging. So here's, here's the general, I think, consensus as to how many species there are, and there are various organizations working on literally identifying, cataloging, uh, uh, and calculating the number of species. About 2.2 million species have been named and cataloged, uh, the majority of which are invertebrates, right? That's an old, not, not a whole other issue. But that's currently where we are, depending on who you look at, I always look at the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, a really good organization through the UN. And so they, they monitor the web of life sort of catalog, and we've got about 2.2 million species in there. Uh, how many are there in total? Well, that depends, right? That depends on who you read and what science tells us. And it's, and it's a very complicated Thing. You can see the second point here that there may be between two and a hundred million species, right? Well, I think a hundred million is probably way too high. The consensus among the ecologists, the latest that I've seen, is about eight to eight point seven ish. That's the and it's an estimate, right? It's an estimate based on the number of species, the fossil record, the evolution of species, speciation of the species itself, things that are well beyond the, the scope of this particular class, right? But about eight. 8.7, I think, is, is what scientists are beginning to think are alive on this planet. So you can do the math, right? We've identified 2.2, and if there's 8, we're only about 25% of the way there, right? And this is not just about, you know, ecologists like Indiana Jones, you know, cutting their way through a rainforest and stumbling across, a, you know, a gigantic new mammal. This is, this is, generally much smaller scale species, and especially the species in the deep ocean trenches, about which we still know very little, okay? So that's another problem. We don't know how many species there are out here, but about 2.2 2, 2, 2 is, a, is a good number to remember. The other thing is, we live on a relatively poor continent in terms of biodiversity, something like 10 to 15% of all the species live in North America, right? There are other parts of the world that are much more diverse okay so that is all summarized here so you know some groups are well known others are not many species live uh, on understudied areas i made that comment especially by, by the deep ocean trenches um so there's a huge amount of work 
is still be done. A couple of years ago, I was at a conference in, in Marseille in, in France, and it was the IUCN con conference. And every couple of years, they come together to update the community of the world on the status of the world species. There's about 15,000 scientists around the world, all communicating and coordinating to try and identify and catalog new species. And again, a lot of this is now being done through extensive and much more sophisticated DNA. This is the status of, uh, this is one of my favorite creatures. I probably shouldn't admit that running a rhino program, but I love giraffes. I don't know if any of you have seen a giraffe in its natural habitat. This past summer in South Africa, uh, our students uh, moved to giraffes to a different reserve. Think about that for a second. A one-ton animal that is gigantic and you have to move it to another reserve. How do you transport to the giraffe? It's pretty, pretty remarkable stuff. Uh, this incredible species, we thought there was a species called the Southern African giraffe. Well, it turns out there's not, based on the DNA sequencing has shown at least four subspecies within, within the giraffe family. So that's where we're starting to see new species discovered all the time. Okay, so you've done this in lab, right? Just as a, a, a quick reminder before we move on, we talk about, in terms of biodiversity, we talk about species richness, okay? So how rich is a particular ecosystem? And that is the fundamental concept of diversity, okay? And it's, it's a number counting game, right? You go through a tropical rainforest and you start looking at different species and you're just counting up the number of species in a forest or whatever the ecosystem is. But it does not address which are common and which are less common, okay? And here's the simple example. Let's say you've got two communities and you walk through one community and 99% of the species in this community are species A and only 1% of species B versus the community on the, on the right-hand side, community two, and they're pretty evenly distributed, right? 50% of species A and 50% of species two. Both of those ecosystems are equally diverse in terms of species richness, right? The number of species. But something's off here. One seems to be more diverse because it's much more evenly spread, right? So that's where this concept of equitability comes in, right? the difference in the relative abundance of species. And so ecologists combine those two. They take richness and they take equity and they combine them into this concept of heterogeneity, right? How diverse is the particular ecosystem based on the number of species and how distributed those species are, okay? Um, and obviously a more uh, a homogenous ecosystem is one where there's far fewer species and probably dominated by one or two species. And here's the, the key take home, right? Tropical forests are the most diverse ecosystems we have for a number of reasons. Okay, cool. There are also different types of diversity. I won't spend too long on the slides. So there's species diversity, which is species richness and, and equitability. There's gene genetic diversity, which we mentioned with that's relative to the giraffe example. And then there's ecosystem diversity, right? What is the overall physical structure of an ecosystem? So ecologists look at all of these types of diversity. So I think that's important just as a, a remember, just to remember when we're talking about biological diversity, it's not just about how many elephants are walking around a particular ecosystem, right? It's much more complicated than that. So there's species, there's genetic, and there's ecosystem. All right, cool. Okay. Oh, good. We've got 10 minutes. This is a big, important diagram. And I will talk to Dr. May, but if I was a betting man, my guess is you'll see this sometime in December again, maybe in that second week in December. Okay. I always put this map in my exam, right? And I'm sure Dr. May will do the same because it's such an important diagram and it underpins, it underscores one of the most recognizable and important patterns in ecology. And I texted Re this morning on my drive in. Uh, I was listening to the BBC radio coming into to TCU this morning, and they were interviewing Brazilian ecologists that was talking about this map. So maybe it was just Carmen that I was supposed to fill in on this lecture this morning, right? So this map shows 
biodiversity, global biodiversity in terms of plant species. So let's spend a few moments on this map. I'll point out some important things. I want to get you to think about what you're seeing on this map. And then I think we will, if she's if she's back here on Thursday morning, we'll we'll come back to this and, and pick up on this map. So what are you looking at? So the bottom here is the legend where as the colors get darker and hotter, so as you move from the light beiges to the reds, the number of plant species increases. So these are diversity zones where this dark red one in here, the, the DZ, the diversity zone, those areas have more than 5,000 species, right? Per 10,000 square kilometers, right? In other words, if you took a square kilometer in that region, right, you would have at least half a species and probably more in that square kilometer. And every square kilometer would be different. Does that make sense, right? So immensely diverse is red and not very diverse, less than 100 per 10,000 square kilometers. Just incidentally, we've got this darker gray and lighter gray in the oceans here, and that shows ocean temperatures. So 29 degrees Celsius or above 27 degrees Celsius. Okay, someone talked to me about this map. If you were to see this in an exam, and the professor said, discuss, what would you say? What are the big take homes? Sorry, I'm probably blocking you here. What are the take homes from this diagram? Global map, biological diversity. Again, just plants. What do you think? Yeah. There's a lot of biodiversity in Indonesia. Okay. A lot of biodiversity here in Indonesia. There's Borneo. Good. Hey, Papua New Guinea. Keep going. Yeah. It seems like most of the biodiversity is like south of the equator. Okay, most of the bio. So here's the here's the equator here, and you're saying most of the bio biodiversity is south of the equator. Give me point. Give me a specific. Like um, South American continent, and there's a lot of biodiversity. Right here. Yeah. Okay. So here's South America, Brazil, and so on, Ecuador. All right. What else? Yeah. Um, the further away you get from the equator, the less magic. Okay. So that's the pattern. All of those are the true. And as you move away from the equator, biodiversity begins to decrease, right? And that is known as, there it is, that is known as the latitudinal diversity gradient, LDG, the latitudinal diversity gradient, right? It's the most recognizable pattern in ecology, right? Latitude. So here's the equator. I'll take that up for a second. There's the equator going across there, right? And we've got 20 degrees here. And 40 degrees there, the tropics are generally about 30 degrees either side of the equator. So the tropics would run right through here, right? The Tropic of Capricorn would be 30 degrees there, and the Tropic of Cancer would be right through the Sahara, here through here, and you know, probably cut through Corpus Christi or something. So those are the tropics. Okay? As you move away from the tropics, diversity decreases. Good. But what else? Is latitude the only control on biological diversity? Oh, there's a nice exam question. Is latitude the only control on biodiversity? Um, it looks like ocean temperatures in, uh, in that area also contribute to. Okay, so why is the, exactly right? So we've got so these are the warm ocean temperatures, the tropical temperatures. Grays are 27. I know you folks are Fahrenheit and yards and inches people, but everyone uses. The metric system on these maps, right? So 29 degrees Celsius, about 80, 81 degrees Fahrenheit, something like so. These are warm tropical waters. So why would that be? Um, the water temperature influences the, the overall climate of the area, making it more like, warmer and more susceptible to growth. Exactly. Nice, right? There's a reason why, you know, the reason why we go on vacation to warm tropical climates. It's kind of nice, right? Plenty of moisture, warm humidity, sunshine. The climatic conditions in the tropics are much more conducive to the growth of ecosystems and much more conducive to supporting a breadth of biological diversity, right? Much trickier if you're going up to the high latitudes in the Arctic. There's a reason why there are so few species there because they have to become much more resilient, much more adaptive to those conditions. Does that make sense? 
So at a global scale, and it's just that, at a global scale, right, climate is an important driver. Climate driven by warm ocean temperatures and warm air currents, warmth, moisture, optimal growing condition in the tropics, right? But, come back to the question, is the latitudinal diversity gradient driven solely by latitude? In other words, is biodiversity, excuse me, solely dependent on latitude? Someone pick out an area that looks a bit odd there. Where's biodiversity extremely high? Where latitude may not be driving it. What's going on here? Or here? Or if you look at the United States, what's going on with this little horseshoe? Much less dramatic because there's much lower diversity. What do you think else is playing a role here in biodiversity? Population. Uh, well, okay. So, yeah, that wouldn't be, sh that wouldn't show up on this map, but I know why you asked, said that, right? People, conversion of land use, industry. Geographically, what else do you think is going on? Yeah. Uh, mountains. What about them? Uh, it looks like the biodiversity is higher, like at the edges of the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really see that. What's going on here? The Andes, the central volcanic ranges of Central America, Rockies, Sierras, Himalayas, right? Great Cape Fold Mountains. Why would mountains be? You're absolutely right. Why would mountains be? Regions of higher diversity, you think? Huh. Uh huh. What does a mountain do? Anybody been to Maui? Anybody been to Hawaii? Been to Maui? Okay. Anybody been up to the top of Haleakala or Okay. All right. Long ago or fairly recently? Uh, two years ago. Okay. So you were down at sea level, right? And what was the climate down there? Uh, warm. Warm. Tropical. Tropical. Yeah. People playing golf, snorkeling, all good. On the top of Haleakala? Cold. Cold. Ferns, dry, right? What mountains do, good. What mountains do is they take the latitudinal diversity gradient of warm and moist in the tropics and cold and dry at the poles, right? They take that latitudinal diversity gradient and they flip it vertically over a very short difference. When you went up Haleakala, you went through nine of the 12 climate zones found on this planet, on one little area, on one little island in the Pacific. Does that make sense? Right, yeah, okay. So, so the, the regional impact on biodiversity through things like mountain building, are enormous, right? There's a reason why on the one side of the mountains in the Andes, right, uh, it's extremely wet, and on the other side, it's extremely dry. You see that in Hawaii as well, on Maui, on Kauai, on the big island of Hawaii. I went to Kauai a couple of years ago. On the one side, right, up near Wailea Canyon, they get something like four to 450 inches of rainfall a year. On the other side, just five miles over, they get less than 25 inches a year. Why? Because all that moist air comes in, it's forced up the mountain, that causes clouds and rainfall, and as that air moves over the mountain, it gets very dry. Does that make sense? The rain shadow effect, right? We see that in the desert southwest. There's a reason why Arizona is so dry, driven largely by the rain shadow effect of the mountain. Same with the Atacama Desert down here in South America, the driest place in the world, right? That air comes over the Andes, and by the time it gets over the other side of the Andes, it's run out of rain. So the point is, before we start thinking about species diversity and protection and building reserves and all of that, we've got to be comfortable with and understand what's driving biodiversity. So the latitudinal diversity gradient is real, it's important, but it's significantly modified by local effects like mountains and ocean currents, as you've just pointed out, and other things. Does that make sense? I need more coffee. Okay.
I may see you Thursday. I mean, then we'll be close.